This is the Earth Science Classroom. This is the Earth as a System playlist in Unit 1, the intro unit to uh, this channel. Um, this is all about basically the spheres and how they are connected. So here we have this beautiful uh, image of the Earth from space. This is from um, a series of images that uh, Apollo 17 took in 1972. It's called the Blue Marble. It's the first kind of real clear image of the Earth uh, taken from the moon during the Apollo 17 mission. And it's beautiful. You get a real perspective of the whole world and you can see there clearly you know defined systems and spheres all working together to generate and produce this beautiful work in earth uh, or Gaia theory if you want to uh, look in that perspective and how thing works as a holistic engine or system so in a previous video um, I looked at different spheres and uh, the main five spheres on the earth and uh, this video is going to be a little bit more detailed on the connections. So this video is this video is going to cover uh, the brief history of the spheres and basically the discoveries and use of the terms, uh, the overview quick of the, the spheres and what they are, what they entail, what they include, uh, how and why we connect the spheres because that's our job as geoscientists, earth scientists, uh, geographers, physical geographers is to connect the spheres and see how they work together and how they impact the Earth and how changes are, are made or occurred. And then look at certain examples of spheres connecting, which we do in class. We do with the various uh, different case studies. And we can link this all the way through our curriculum all the way through the, the year. Hydrosphere. And hydro this part of the root of the word hydro is Greek for water. And the word sphere just means the realm or the region or the encompassing area or domain of water. So a lot of these words derive from the ancient Greek um, uh, origins of the word. So the hydrosphere was first really discussed as a term or coined as a term uh, around 1887 by a gentleman called Edward uh, Seuss. He was an Austrian geologist. So he kind of coined the term uh, during an article or piece of literature based on the Alps. Uh, in Europe. So next we have the biosphere. In the biosphere, you can actually, you know, you know a little arrow into uh, Central Africa and the African Great Lakes, and look at maybe example is the uh, the Serengeti or Great Plains, that area, or even down towards South Africa and and Mozambique in this area. But you can imagine those very large, um, you know, animals, the huge diversity of different species in that kind of, of uh, biome, that kind of habitat. And biosphere, again, uh, biosphere comes from the Greek, Greek for life, okay? And again, anything that is living, anything that is um, to do with any kind of life is under the very large umbrella of the biosphere. Now, there's other videos we'll go into uh, for all these different spheres in more detail and how they relate, but now we're just going to basically just go over them in general. So the biosphere, again, by uh, Seuss, the Austrian geologist, uh, in 1885. And this was pretty much uh, looking at, you know, came from... Um, a book that first coined the uh, the term biosphere. Now, this was then uh, taken further with the Gaia theory, which is uh, based on, or the word comes from the Greek goddess of the earth. Gaia. And this, this Gaia theory states that the earth as a living entity has um, kind of the ability to 
work or behave as a living thing rather than just an inanimate piece of rock with the surface being kind of more dynamic and more obviously life filled but the whole thing the whole earth as a living being next sphere we have the atmosphere atmos is greek for vapor and it used to be called basically more the the vapor um regional vapor realm but then moved uh, into more of the commonly termed atmosphere so this was again the the well this was coined in 16 uh, 38 so it's the oldest term out of these spheres and this was used first in English or it was first in English text in 1638 and it was in reference to the moon actually so it was in reference to the moon's atmosphere which back then they had an had a curiosity about the moon's atmosphere if there was an atmosphere what kind of like you know uh, gases were involved, but now we know that the moon does not have an atmosphere due to its gravitational pull or lack thereof. And um, and then from basically from 1670 onwards, we know an atmosphere as the term used today. Next one is the geosphere. Geo basically stands for Earth in terms of the solid part. The solid component of the earth so looking at all the rocks the rocky body which is surface and also the interior and also refers to the history and development and formation and of the earth so this was kind of uh you know stated in 1864 and it was basically you know seuss obviously looked at the lithosphere and coined that phrase but the general geosphere was in 1864 and it was more of the geospheric realm which was the term and then later on we changed it or the community uh, changed it to geosphere the last one is cryosphere which again comes from the Greek the word origin of cryo uh, is Krios, which means uh, cold, so the cold region, so looking at the ice and snow, the glaciers, the ice caps, uh, permafrost in the soil, um, and any kind of snow precip as well in high altitudes, you know, mountain ranges, um, you know, and also the the changes within that uh, amount of coverage of snow and ice. Also looking at albedo as well, which is a reflected energy off different surfaces different wavelengths and also you know so the changes so the Pleistocene uh, Pleistocene ice age changes over the last two and a half um, uh, million years so the cryosphere is going to complete our five principal spheres that are all working as a system to create our natural world now here's the difficulty the difficulty the complexity the range, obviously the size, and the time. All of these different variables link to all five spheres and produce endless connections over time and space. Some, or if quite a few, that we can monitor, we can experiment, we can see and visualize and observe changing. Some, we have to uh, have more empirical data and have more observations and more um, educated guesses as to the, the, the changes that occur between these spheres. But all these five spheres are constantly working, constantly interacting, connecting, communicating, um, having uh, relationships between each other in terms of what they do. They move matter and energy at different amounts, different times, and different locations. And to quantify or kind of break down each sphere is quite simple in terms of what they cover, what, what's included. However, the connections are far more complex. And the difficulty is for Earth scientists is to not get too broad or not get too too uh, small and, and microscopic in their studies because then you ignore some of the other 
let's say, uh, meso or macro elements that can uh, can change the system or change the the in the connections. So it's very hard and extremely complex. And you're looking at a whole planet of of constantly dynamic processes that work off each other and with lag times and different time periods of seeing end products of the process. So the, the sheer size and range of which to study is immense over not just over seconds, but up to billions of years. These changes can occur. And then obviously the complexity of not just one or two, but all five connected in different ways. So this is a very large and complex subject. So if I put all the five spheres at the top and we have an example, so we have an example right here of a volcanic eruption. Now it could be a certain type of eruption like Hawaiian or Strombolian or Palaian or even um, uh, let's say a larger one like a Tambora eruption or Krakatoa that's more world event rather than more regional or local. So you've got the uh, examples, you've got a nice uh, Strombolian eruption, Palaian eruption, and also a nice Icelandic eruption here with a fissure, or this is Hawaiian eruption. So you can go into details of the types of eruptions, but there are similarities and characteristics that transcend all types with a basic eruption and the interactions that take place every second because of this eruption and the interactions between the spheres. So if we look at the volcano, obviously we can link it up to the solid earth and you know igneous rock and we have some uh, extrusive um, magma, so lava and the formation of extrusive igneous rocks like uh, basalt or or pumice or tuff uh, or uh, another volcanic rock. So obviously the layers of the earth, the crust, lithosphere, you can discuss that kind of stuff. Then you can look at the uh, hydrosphere and you can look at the water inside the magma. The magma is composed partly of water, and that would also uh, decide its explosivity. It also increased the amount of gas content, which would again increase the pressure and increase the size of the eruption. Again, you can link it to the types of volcanoes you get. You can get the atmosphere, the interaction with the atmosphere. So the volcano is interacting with the atmosphere constantly by exchanging gases, and also solid material. Lava bombs, lava blocks, the formation of uh, obsidian maybe, or volcanic glass, uh, depends on the amount of water content and how fast it's erupting and the, and, the, and the change of temperatures. So, and pumice. Okay, so the exchange of materials, both energy and matter between the atmosphere. Now the biosphere, the um, the damage by the eruption, the various eruption um, characteristics or features like the haas or maybe some earthquakes associated with a volcanic eruption that would cause damage to uh, immediate area, the habitats, ecosystems on the volcano, uh, perhaps uh, some organisms that survive in this high concentration of sulfur or high heat organisms. And then maybe you have, depends on the amount of the height or elevation of the mountain or the volcano, you might have some snow melt, which would relate, relate to a lahar and you would get the flow of basically mud and water 
uh, and you know bits of debris going down the side of the volcano, again affecting the biosphere, again affecting the geosphere, flowing down river systems and fluvial valleys, and again looking at the hydrosphere as well, linking up with the water systems and, and rivers, um, and maybe some exchange with atmosphere. So you can, with a simple volcanic eruption as the example, you can definitely connect all five spheres uh, depending on the type of eruption and the size of the volcano and also the location. All right, so the next example would be like a coastal environment. A coastline, this is a clift uh, coastline with some uh, characteristics and some features like some stacks. Okay and there's some uh, ancient arches that have collapsed. But you have this, obviously, uh, hydraulic action and wave action with maybe mod tide-modified beaches or just wave-dominated beaches. But you have this, this sandy uh, area here and the coastline. So first you can do, obviously, you know, as a, as a, a beginning is look at the cliffs and the uh, sea floor, which is exposed right here in low tide, with the sand right here, the beach face right here, um, maybe the contours and gradient of the beach, looking at the type of rock, okay, maybe it's metamorphic, maybe it's igneous, maybe it's sedimentary, depends on the coastline, location, and the formation and tectonic history is this a convergent or divergent boundary is it passive or active and looking at the interactions between um the geosphere and the hydrosphere so we can add in obviously the ocean uh waves the ocean itself the water itself is going to exchange energy and matter with the geosphere looking at um, possible tides and tidal ranges uh looking at uh, the weathering and erosion, which again can we look at the atmosphere, so we can link this up to weather and erosion. The exchange of gases from ocean spray, okay, uh, to evaporation. We can also link back to atmosphere, hydrosphere in precip, so you have uplift caused by the geosphere and the cliffs um, have. Um, uh, forcing the air to lift over the cliffs, uh, causing condensation past the dew point and forcing rain to fall on the land, which would then come back through fluvial systems and uh, lakes and, and, and rivers and groundwater and caves back to the ocean, again, creating a nice cycle, the water cycle. The biosphere, the caves, the cliffs could be home to habitats, birds, animals, uh, obviously the fish, and marine life, both in the ocean and the coastal regions, coastal areas, maybe even some um, some pools, maybe some uh, uh, intertidal pools as well being created. Uh, cryosphere from this exact picture, maybe um, you know winter time might look at depends on the location and latitude. You might get some snowfall, but you again can denote maybe there is ice um, uh, layers due to the geologic history of the area. Well, it was formerly tectonic or glaciated, if it's Western Hemisphere or sorry, Northern Hemisphere. So we can link up basically thousands of processes and connections from a simple picture of a coastline or previously uh, a volcanic eruption. So guys, I hope this helps with connections and spheres and uh, look out for the next video.